Hi, this is Marcus Fares, founder of Dezine, from coming live from the Dezine Broadcasting Studio in London. And this is part two of our week-long collaboration with Dutch Design Week 2020. We have a series of talks with curators and designers who are participating in Dutch Design Week this year. And of course, Dutch Design Week this year is a little bit different from previous iterations because most of it is happening virtually. Um, we're able to bring together designers each day around a certain theme of Dutch Design Week. And today's theme is stories of a product. And that comes under the, the master theme of Dutch Design Week this year, which is the new intimacy. And the new intimacy is exploring new ways of being intimate in a COVID era when we can't get together, we can't have relationships with people in the usual ways, we can't assemble the Design Weeks and so on and so forth. We have uh, four speakers with us today. I'm just going to quickly introduce them all to the audience. First, we have Lisa Harden, who's a curator from Dutch Design Week. And Lisa has put together today's selection of designers and has worked on the theme stories of a product for Dutch Design Week. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Marcus. Nice to see you again. Tell us a little bit about yourself. First of all, where are you? I'm in Amsterdam at the moment. So I was in, uh, in Eindhoven experiencing our uh, virtual festival still uh, at our uh, home base in Eindhoven. But today I'm back in my home office, um, uh, yeah, virtually participating in the festival. And we worked together a few years back, didn't we? You helped us put together a series of talks, the Good Design for a Bad World talks that we did. It must have been three years ago now. Yeah. A little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, so I'm part of the program team actually within Dutch Design Week. And uh, together with my colleagues, we make the selection of uh, uh, the Dutch Design Week program each year. Uh, this year, of course, a very different year in this pandemic and uh, trying to make a nice selection around the topic of the new intimacy. And at the same time, of course, balancing out uh, the right balance of designers uh, that are joining us from a bottom up perspective in Dutch Design Week and curating a couple of um, uh, program uh, uh, parts amongst which the stories of a product um, and a couple of talks um, about different design related topics. So tell us about the theme we're going to be looking at today, stories of a product. What does that mean? What is it? Yeah, so I will uh, tell you a bit more about that in, uh, in a presentation uh, in a bit. Um, but stories of a product uh, relates to the new intimacy and how we as people relate uh, to our objects and whether or not we still have an intimate relation with uh, the objects that surround us. Okay, and the three designers we have today, uh, starting off with Sital Solanke. Hi, Sital. Hi, Marcus. We were actually on a call last week. This is becoming a, a regular hangout for us. But Sital, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Uh, yeah, so I'm usually based in London, UK. I'm currently in Lagos, Nigeria. And my role is, oh, well, I'm the founder and director of Matter, which is a relational practice and we bridge and build kinships between the material world, the immaterial and the virtual. So I would describe myself as a materials translator of sorts. And if the world had been normal this year, presumably would you have been in Eindhoven presenting this, this project? Absolutely, yeah. And how do you feel about not, not being able to do that? Well, I think it's great that we can still connect um, virtually. So it's not completely, um, it's just a slight compromise or a rejig. So it's, it's still happening at least. Okay, great. Well, well, we'll see what you had, what you have contributed to Dutch Design Week in just a second. Uh, next we have Christian Meindertsma, Christine Meindertsma, sorry. <laughs> I knew I'd get that wrong. Hi, Christine, how are you? Hi, Marcus, I'm doing good. Thank you. So first of all, where are you today? Uh, I'm in a small village in the center of Holland where I live, in my office. And um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm a product designer. I graduated in 2003 from the Design Academy in Eindhoven. I used to be based in Rotterdam, but uh, a few years back I moved to a tiny village with my family where I work and live. And uh, my work um, focuses on products, researching where they come from and uh, also where they go to after their life. And 
when you said that you graduated in 2003, it suddenly reminded me how long I've known you, because I think I met you in 2003. Was it your graduation project was the, the pig book? Is that right? It wasn't my graduation. It was a few years later, but um, uh, I think because it was such a nerdy research project, people often think it can not, not be anything else than a graduation project, but it was a few years later. But uh, yeah, it's quite a while ago. Oh, I think so. Maybe I think I came across the book when I was judging Dutch Design Awards that year. But just briefly oh. about the book. This, is it called The Story of a Pig or something like that? Story of a Pig? Yeah, it's a book that uh, that is basically a product catalog about one single pig uh, with a number 05049. And um, yeah, I just wanted to show if you follow this one single animal all the way to its end products, where does it end up in? And uh, I spent about three years researching like all these strands until the last product. And it's a, it was a very powerful book because it was it showed many people I think for the first time how many things that we rely on day to day have animal products in them. It was quite a shocking book to read, and I still have it, by the way, the it's copy nice that you gave me. And finally, <laughs> Aniela, and I'm going to have to read this from the. <laughs> Uh, Fiddler Viruzeshka. How did I get on there, Aniela? Yeah, that's amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, so I am uh, I am actually a recent graduate. So I've uh, graduated from MA Fashion Futures uh, this year, and I'm based in London. Um, degree word, I was at London College of Fashion. Uh, and I, what I do, uh, what I was doing um, earlier and what I kind of explored in my, uh, during this project was um, how we come together through stories and how uh, products are vehicles of stories and uh, how we can um, build more fulfilling relationships with them really. Because um, I think we've got an issue of fulfillment uh, and, and um, yeah, that's what I'm going to be talking about later on. Uh, Thanks so much for having me here. It's really exciting. Great. Well, it's great to meet you all. Let's get on and see the presentations. Lisa, do you want to go first and explain why you've curated this selection of designers and what this theme of stories of a product is and how it relates to the big theme of Dutch Design Week, which is, of course, uh, the new intimacy? Yes. Let me get my presentation on here. Oh, now we're. Is it on? Can you guys see it? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, um, yeah. So the new intimacy um, is the main uh, theme of Dutch Design Week this year. I think you guys elaborated uh, uh, on it already yesterday in a really nice uh, design talk. Um, so today we discussed the subtopic stories of a product. And um, when we decided on the theme, um, of course, the pandemic had actually just hit us and we realized how um, this new world that we lived in uh, threatened the way uh, we as people engage with other people in a very uh, uh, scary way. So all of a sudden we were not able to um, uh, come close to each other, touch each other, and the way we communicate with each other is now via screens. So um, the new intimacy as an overall theme for Dutch Design Week really made sense to us. And after that, we sat with, this, the, with our team and we said, okay, so we want to uh, address this topic uh, from different design angles. And of course, product design is a major um, uh, element of the design field, also within Dutch Design Week. And we wanted to address the new intimacy from a sort of a product design a viewpoint. Um, and we discussed, um, of course, during Dutch Design Week, you always see a, um, a very, or with Dutch Design Week, we want to address product design from a sort of sustainable uh, point of view. So we show a selection always of um, designers working on material research, showing innovations uh, of new materials, circular materials. And we also want to address product design from an angle of production. So we show examples of designers working on more sustainable production methods, um, no waste production lines, etc. All very important and crucial elements to design sustainable products. But during this special year, um, we actually wanted to shift our gaze with uh, this uh, subtopic to the way we as people actually uh, engage with our objects. And uh, of course, during this pandemic, we were all all of a sudden uh, sitting at home 
um, instead of going to the office and meeting each other in sort of a generic uh, surroundings, we all saw each other in our personal space. Um, so uh, all of a sudden um, we were talking to our colleagues from their kitchens, their living rooms, and even their bedrooms. We saw the couch they sat on, the TV they uh, use, or the ugly coffee mug they uh, drink coffee from, which is important to them because it was a gift for their wedding anniversary. And it made us uh, realize how in the no new normal, it's even more, it even shows more that the, the objects that we surround ourselves with um, actually tell us a bit uh, about who we are. Um, this is me, for example. You already briefly saw me before. This is a screenshot of me in a Zoom call. Um, and during the pandemic, uh, you, you all of the, I all of a sudden became this person with, uh, with two guitars, uh, a very small TV and a weird creature in the background that nobody really knows what it is. Um, so with stories of a product, we actually uh, want to talk about the meaning of objects, the meaning of objects and the relation we have as human beings with our objects. Um, we had a really nice um, uh, exhibition planned for this, which unfortunately we had to postpone to next year because of the last minute COVID changes. Um, but we're happy to have uh, uh, this amazing uh, discussion this afternoon um, about the topic and the selection of, uh, of speakers that we'll, uh, we'll look after, we'll, we'll listen to after this, um, uh, that all relate uh, to this uh, topic of how we, uh, as humans, engage with our products. Um, we'll have uh, Sito, who already briefly introduced herself, uh, uh, Christine, with an amazing project, and Aniela, who already uh, beautifully said how objects are actually vehicles of stories. So I'm uh, looking forward to, uh, to the presentations. Great, thanks very much, Lisa. If I could ask one little question that's been bothering me, actually, your first image there, the, the new intimacy logo, what is it? It looks like some kind of strange fish. <laughs> it's an abstract translation of a, of a material. And does it move? Is it like a kind of... It, sh it should move, but not in this, this is an image, but it's actually sort of a GIF type of uh, material flowing around. So you said that there had been plans for an exhibition during Dutch Design Week. Tell us a bit more about what the exhibition would have been. It would have been recreations of these strange room sets or what would have, how would it have manifested itself? We selected a couple of personal stories uh, of people um, and their objects that uh, go with them. And we want to present them actually across the entire city of Eindhoven in, um, in glass boxes so that the visitors would stumble upon a random selection of objects uh, that maybe to that person uh, would not seem important or valuable. But by listening to the personal story behind it, uh, it would actually become clear what, why a, a certain object is important for someone. Um, but for that type of exhibition, we really wanted sort of the engagement with the audience. Uh, which is exactly what we can't do at the moment, unfortunately. Um, but I'm sure we'll find a way uh, when COVID is a, a bit more behind us to do something like this. Okay, and then briefly, so how is Eindhoven, how is Dutch Design Week going? I know you're not there right now, but what is someone who's been embedded in that kind of buzzing experience the last few years? Is it, is it weird being in Eindhoven without thousands of designers crowding into bars and exhibitions and so on? It's totally weird. It's, uh, it also makes me a little bit sad, actually, um, to walk around the city with, well, hardly anyone on the streets. And I visited uh, the Van Abbe Museum uh, because some locations do still have an exhibition because they are allowed to be open uh, regardless, but with very limited amount of people. And I was in the Van Abbe Museum and I was alone, <laughs> which was uh, a very uh, impressive experience, uh, but also a bit sad because, of course, Dutch Design Week is also about all the interaction with people, and it's sad to to miss out on that. Okay, thanks a lot, Lisa. So let's go to Sital now. Sital, do you want to fire up your presentation and, and show us your work? Yes, of course. I'll just do that now. Great. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I really wanted to demonstrate a method of which I've created uh, within my practice where it's very much, well, it's this 12 stage process or methodology by which materials are at the center 
we've historically um, been more human centered, but I want to reorient that towards planet centered or planet centric, um, because I think materials really form the storytelling component as well as our behaviors and the systems that surround them. So we, it's kind of, because it's this 12 stage process, I'm kind of like um, using the analogy of Alcoholics Anonymous. So they have like a 12 stage process of which they can kind of wean themselves off um, addiction. So we've kind of been addicted to consumption in some ways over the past few generations, I would say, since the industrial revolution of sorts. So it's very much a reorientation towards uh, a plural and decolonized way of approaching design. So having materials at the center, it means we need to understand what things are made from, which also allow us to engage with the immateriality of the object, as well as perhaps it might be virtual or have a virtual component. And then we start to engage with that with the human world. So we begin with non-humans and then engage with how an individual might play a role within relating to those materials, which then means we understand our individual role within the community or society, which means we therefore understand our role within the planet or what our roles are towards the planet. And for me, and my practice, it's very much um, towards guardianship or stewardship or a caretaking role that we have um, the ability to become. And therefore that reorients our mindsets, our behaviors and mechanisms, which I relate to as systems. And then that alters the way that we um, engage with time and dimensions, spectrums and relating to scale and also landscapes, which are futures. And you will notice that everything is plural. So I believe in my practice that it's very much um, gearing us towards inclusive, um, diverse, and what's the other one? More response able um, choices and decisions rather than thinking of, of our future um, as singular. For me, it's multiple futures um, that we can all exist within. And ultimately that's what this presents. And that helps us reorient our mindsets, our behaviors and mechanisms. And the, this is very much for alignment. And this is the ultimate goal. And it's a quote by Sidney Sheldon and he basically says, try to leave the, the earth a better place than when you arrived. So that's my um, kind of way of engaging with the world and relating to the world through materials. Thanks very much. And um, had Dutch Design Week taken place, how would this have manifested itself at the Design Week? Was that this gonna be the basis of an exhibition or how would it have manifested itself? Well, actually, we're doing a talk on Thursday evening, and that's going to be in the format of a, um, it's part of the Connected Living series, and we're basically hosting a material therapy show. So imagine it as a um, morning show, a bit like Jerry Springer or Oprah, and we're inviting different audience members to inhabit and embody a material and they, they will share their material woes with um, the three therapists that I've invited. So myself, um, my friend Yagwa, who's based here in Lagos, and then my friend Lyle, who's based in South Africa. So we are going to be the therapists for the materials to help them, well, to guide them towards those futures that are response able and um, diverse and inclusive. So they can see we can start to begin to relate to those materials and they have their own stories as well as the human story. So it's a different way of relating, but, and a humor, humorous one, but slightly critical as well. 
And you're talking about how people relate to materials. And the, the, the theme of this talk is stories of products, which is about how people can build relationships with, with things like manufactured things or crafted things. Is there a difference in the way people relate to materials as to, opposed to the way they relate to things made from materials? Yeah, I think so. I think if it's an object, it's seen as something that perhaps has a relationship to their lives because uh, of the way that it's designed, it has a functionality perhaps, or it has sentiment. Um, and I think with materials, they are seen as something that's quite extractive and for human consumption and therefore isn't as seen as much of something that has its own agency actually or it's kind of misunderstood a lot of the time so we're trying to bring more awareness to that and materials have their own characteristics and behaviors as we do and we're shining a light on that so in the form of humanizing them if so to speak and you talked about how at the beginning of your talk how we're addicted to consumption and you talked about the similarity with your your methodology and Alcoholics Anonymous. So is this, you think there's a, a, a route away from civilization's addiction to extractive practices? Do you think it's something that can be overcome? I think it's very systemic. So a lot of this is being highlighted this year with coronavirus and also I think Black Lives Matter movement and all sorts of systems Pandemic changes that are surfacing actually and I think a lot of those are stemmed in such deep rooted issues that for them to be surfaced it means we're becoming more aware of what these issues are and therefore I think for me I'm really focused on the micro and very localized communities of how we can encourage change to occur so those relationships are really key, I think, in order to make some kind of change. And I'm not here to change the world. I'm at least here to um, bring more awareness to what is possible. So I'm really very much about possibilities. And is this an abstract exercise or is it, does it have real practical implications? Are there any examples of, of change on a micro level that you've managed to effects uh, in individuals or organizations or anything like that? Give yeah, fun funnily enough, my work is quite international. So um, a project I was involved in in Bali, um, working with a hotel, independently run hotel called Potato Head. And the hotel was designed by OMA and it was 170 rooms in total and we mapped the island of its materials and also engaged with the craftspeople on the island who very much engaged and are very present within the, the materials that they are working with. So there was this kind of ongoing dialogue or engagement between the materials that exist in the island, on the island as well as the people working with those materials to bring light and kind of presence to where you are in the world through its materiality. So the entire hotel was made entirely from materials in Indonesia, which we were mapping and also bringing into practice. And we were working with people like Max Lam and Faye Tugud, um, as well as the craftspeople on the island. And this, there was always this kind of dialogue of, um, materials, craft, and um, implementation. So very much a cultural, material cultural project, as well as um, something that's very practical to show that actually it is possible to achieve, not at such a scale, but also in a, in a very small island actually. And um, so this is something that has been a really, uh, a drive for change socially, economically, politically even because I think recycling on the island is very limited if it's not even organized by the government. So it's something that we were definitely very keen to push. So we mapped local materials, native materials, and also what I call migrant materials, which I see as waste. Um, so yeah, 
kind of implementing that train of thought into the entire building interiors, products, experience. Um, yeah, so quite a big project, but it was really um, meaningful. Actually, I did a talk back in July, a live talk like this one with Dan Mitchell from Potato Head. Was he the guy, he's the creative director of Potato Head and Bali. Is he the guy you worked with on this? Yeah, very closely. And we also spoke to uh, Lena Klaus, who was the artist that made, it, made a big installation using all of the flip-flops that have washed up on the, the beaches of Bali that have crossed the ocean. Exactly, yeah, the same guy. Yeah. Yeah, same crowd. Okay, so that's up on Dazine. We published that on the 3rd of July, that talk for a related background. Thanks a lot, Sital. Um, Christine, if you could share your presentation with us now. Yes, you can start. Okay, there we go. Can you still hear me? Yeah, can see you and hear you. Because okay, so. Um, I'm showing three projects uh, at Dutch Design Week this week, or virtually. Uh, one is um, a rug made from linen. It's made from the linen from a field of flax um, that I followed in 2012. Um, flax is the crop that's native to the Netherlands. So before cotton arrived, we used mainly wool and linen from flax, which- Dean, we can't yeah. see the presentation just yet. Don't know oh. if Sure. You can't? Okay. No. Oh, you. sorry. There we go. Um, you can see it now, maybe? Yeah, that's it. You could just put that. Like that. Is that better? Ah. Perfect. That's it. Okay. So um, there's the flex that I was talking about. Um, so why I am so into flex is because it's our native uh, one of the native plants that we've, it has a really rich history. So I started following this farmer called Gertjan van Dongen, growing the flax. And 90% um, of the Dutch flax is exported to China to be um, produced in all kinds of products. And I was interested in what's left of the local industry and uh, yeah, what does it look like? So uh, when the flex was about to disappear, I bought the whole plot, 10,000 kilos of flex, um, which sounds a lot, but I wanted to do like a serious attempt to, to see what local industrial production looks like. Uh, I mapped all the materials that came from the plot. Um, like you can, and then built a website around it. And together with filmmaker Rolf van Tour, we filmed uh, each step of the process and also shared it on this website. Um, the most refined thing I made uh, was a very fine linen. But what's interesting, if you, if you follow all the strands, um, for instance, with making this very fine yarn, uh, also came a sort of sidetrack, which was a more coarser yarn. So I had a whole pallet of this yarn stacked here. And then I got an assignment from a Dutch company called CS Rugs, if I wanted to design a rug for them. So this is the rug that's uh, exhibited this week. Um, uh, CS Rugs has a very high tech tufting robot that they developed themselves. And um, so I designed this rug that basically depicts the field where the flex comes from. Um, when I made this for them, it was made actually last year. And then they asked, could you do a similar project for us, which tells the story about where the wool that we use mostly comes from. Um, and um, so I said, yeah, I suggested that we work with Rolf van Tour, the filmmaker again, and then that we make a film about the wool and its complete process uh, and also design rugs that that show the structures of all the land um, the, the wool crosses basically, because of course the sheep live on the land, um, what they're built of, what the wool is made of, it's all based on, on the land. So um, then we made the plan and then the coronavirus hit us and uh, Rule was unable to travel. So we asked the local filmmaker to film in New Zealand and the rest uh, is filmed by Rolf van Tour, so I'm going to start the video.
um, uh, I was asked to design a series of rugs and the, the first one is this one, which is at the Van Abbe Museum at the moment. It's a five by five meter rug and it basically depicts um, the landscape of the factory itself. And uh, the wool is a combination of this New Zealand wool and a woolen yarn that I developed myself that has a recycled content in it. The recycled content is made of recycled woolen sweaters. As you can see if you look really close by. Um, it's a yarn that's spun in Donegal where they are specialized in making this fleck, which it, from the old days was very much based on scarcity of color. Um, so all these sweaters became tiny little flecks in the yarn. And uh, yeah, what I really like about this Donegal tweed or what I learned from it is that for, for them it really represents the landscape and the uh, the richness of the landscape. So um, the rugs of CS rugs, we will make uh, variations also on color, and hopefully, um, yeah, it will be will be similar like this idea of the Donegal tweed. Um, the second project that I'm showing is a project done with a local glassmaker. I, a few years ago, I moved to the countryside in Holland. I'm very close by to the city of uh, village of Leerdam which is a glass blower's village. And I really wanted to work locally here as well. And I met a master glass blower, Gert Bulet, And he told me about when you blow glass on copper, it's actually possible to keep the glass on the blowpipe, uh, which I thought was quite magical because it's apparently possible to catch that first moment where the glass blower blows his air into the glass normally with a normal blowpipe you have to take it off but i thought what if i design a copper blowpipe for him then we could maybe make a product that would actually sort of um, solidify this first magic moment um, so this is also a small film made by Rufen Tour. <laughs> And then the last thing I would have wanted to show, but uh, I heard that it's a little bit complicated with rights or a bit scary to show something that's from television. But uh, from uh, in two weeks time, I will present, be presenting the next season of For the Forum, which is a Dutch television program about everyday products. And um, what I really like about doing is uh, doing it is uh, every episode is about one everyday product that you never think about. For instance, last season we made a whole program about the wine glass or the toilet or the sneaker or the bra. And um, uh, this season we will be looking at the coffee cup. Um, so yeah, you see it every day, but you never think about it. So we are we we travel to Meissen to find about all about the porcelain. Um, but we also look at why did the paper cup suddenly become so important in our lives? Where did it come from? Uh, we made an episode about the watch. Uh, we find out why the ocean was so important in the development of the watch. 
Um, we look at cars and aerodynamics, but we also look at this wonderful design. It's a Dutch design. It's 20, 25 years old. It's a car specially designed for disabled people. Um, and we have a whole episode that's about the court shoe. Like, why did we start walking around in these really high heeled shoes? And this is actually one of the first ones. So that was my presentation. Thanks very much, Christine. So as a designer, are you more interested in materials and stories and narratives than in actual products, would you say? Uh, how do you mean? Well, often, well, often your work or always your work, it's very much about the narrative, uh, like the, the, the pig book, for example, the product was a book, but it wasn't yeah. so much a book to be a book. It was a research mm -hmm. project. Yes. The, 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 the flax project, uh, you took the flax and then you made a carpet out of it, which sort of told the story yeah, yeah. Flax came from. So my question is, do you, are you more interested in the story of the flax than in making a carpet? I think so. But then, for instance, with the woolen version, um, also the company was, a, they wanted to make a product, obviously, that you can use. So uh, they said, okay, it, it's nice, this, this story that you tell, but it has to be an actual usable product. So you can only tuft it this high and you can, so I, I would prefer to make products that tell the story, but that are also usable and that can be like normal products in your everyday life. I think that's kind of the challenge. And Sita was talking about how, you know, society has become addicted to consumption and that has led to kind of environmental destruction and, and all kinds of negatives that we're trying to find our way out of through notions like the circular economy and, and so mm -hmm. on. Cool. So when you're researching, um, I mean, sheep, for example, there's lots of nice things about sheep, but there's also lots of awful things about sheep. I mean, they eat everything. You could tell from the picture you showed of New Zealand that, you know, there were gullies with no trees in them. Are you did yeah. as a designer to tell stories that are unsettling to people or, or do you feel like uh, you want to put a, a positive message into things? Like the pig story, for example, it could have been a horror story, couldn't it? Yes. Well, I think um, an honest story is always a layered story. And I think what people don't want to hear is complicated stories, but stories about products are always complicated and always layered and always have um, multiple storylines in it. So with the pig book, I really tried to make a book that, that respects all the different storylines, because if the moment you choose one, you're always already being sort of dishonest. So with the wool, um, yeah, there, there are many different stories to tell about sheep in New Zealand, for instance, that they are not native to New Zealand and now there are like almost 40 million sheep there. Um, we also have a lot of sheep in the Netherlands we, whose wool is being thrown away because it's more expensive to shear a sheep than uh, it is uh, than what you get paid for the wool as a farmer. So I'm um, also doing projects with local wool, but I, I just think it's important to not also not oversimplify things. And, um, and also that it's very difficult to do something perfect the first time. And we just have to sort of work on that all together. And you did some research, which was shown at the Design Museum in London a couple of years back, which was looking at products that said they were a certain type of material but often weren't such a thing so it's often it's possible also to tell a dishonest story about provenance through a product isn't it tell us a little yeah. bit about that yeah so for the design museum it was this picture that i showed earlier with the uh, colored sweaters that was just right after they went to the through a fiber sort machine which is a very interesting machine because it can scan uh, garments on their content. So uh, until now, garments have been sorted by people. But as a human, you can't see if something is 100% wool or 98% wool. Or So um, I sent all those sweaters through the machine and then um, uh, compared the labels to what the machine said. And what was interesting is that the people who were developing this machine, they said, yeah, in the beginning, we thought 
that we didn't develop the technology right because it would keep throwing a 100% sweater, for instance, in an 80% wool uh, bin. But then they found out that just a really large percentage of um, labels that are on our clothing are just lying, basically. But that's, if you think about it, it's not so strange because there's nobody who checks. Uh, and also, uh, the, uh, the making process of garments is very complicated. So all along the line, or all along the process, there are people cheating. <laughs> And it's just very complicated to find out. But the good thing is that that it's happening. Like with technology like that, we we will know what's inside our product, and hopefully, um, yeah, will be more honest products. Yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it? That um, often we, as consumers, we try to do the right thing. Like we buy a diesel car because we think the emissions are low, and then we find out that the car companies were cheating on the emissions. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know whether this is true but i was reading a couple of days ago that apparently the whole notion of plastic recycling was an idea invented by the plastics industry they said if we just stick labels on the plastic saying it can be recycled yeah then people will feel less guilty but it's not true because it can't be recycled mm -hmm. i don't know whether that's true or not but it feels like we've all been tricked into thinking that if we separate our waste at the end of the week into various bags then we're doing a good job for the planet yeah, in the Netherlands, there was big news in the last days that uh, we thought a large percentage of our plastics were being recycled, but apparently they, for some reason, turned up in roads, beside roads in Turkey, because somewhere along the way, these things just go wrong. So it's, I think, it's still very complicated processes. But But the material world is so complicated that for 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 you as a person it's just we even if you're if it's the subject that you study like even it's still really complicated because we are surrounded by so many different products which each have such different uh, com complicated stories stories about how they were made where they are going um and yeah it's important to tell the stories but it's 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 complicated because um, there's just so many of it. I think we'll leave it there, there for now, Christine. We'll come back to this topic a bit later when we're all discussing. But let's finally go to Aniela. Aniela, if you could share your presentation with us. Uh, let me, one second. Is it working? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Great. Um, so, hello. Um, I'm gonna uh, present today the Diamond Makers Lab, which was uh, initially my uh, MA project, but now it's studying, living its own life, and it's really interesting for me as well. Uh, so, Diamond Makers uh, is a hybrid between a lab and a tailor-made retail experience, uh, which is able to create diamonds for, but from many different things, uh, usually unexpected items. Um, so it explores possibilities from already existing science um, uh, and the way how the diamonds are made is by um, applying uh, high temperature and pressure to carbon. So uh, diamonds in general are formed from carbon, which can be isolated from most types of uh, organic ash. But then, um, and what you can see on this uh, image are some of the examples that carbon can be extracted from. But then I would argue that the diamond is less significant than the meaning and story that can emerge from the process of uh, its make. Uh, and the simple adjustment of the source could the impact or change the diamond's value entirely. And the way how I, the way, uh, one second. Yes, great. So I have spent uh, more than a year asking around what people value and which objects are there to them and um, eventually what they could consider turning into a diamond. Uh, some of them treated it super seriously while others were a bit more of a, a joke related suggestions, but there is a still very big value in the joke. 
Um, so this way I interview, uh, I, I identified about 100 things, actually exactly 100 things. And uh, this focus on the thirst gave uh, my interviewees opportunity to choose the meaning uh, behind the, uh, and emotional significance behind the uh, diamond that they would consider having. So the thirst is completely customizable and the selection process is designed to trigger personal reflection on values followed by desires. So the, what was interesting for me in this project was to um, design a way uh, that is uh, the design, design a system in which people reflect upon what they actually value and then they consider acquiring product. Uh, so if we can make a diamond from most of the types of organic ash, if diamonds are whatever, <laughs> not forever, uh, as uh, we've been told. Uh, and by the way, diamonds actually burn at 850 degrees, if I remember it well. So they're not forever. Uh, and it's good to keep them away from the fire. <laughs> but if they can be made from whatever, the question is what kind of diamond cysts would align with your values and why? Uh, but also what would you consider burning into ash to then turn it into a diamond? Um, so aligning products with customer values through universal emotional stories is how marketing works now. But I'm interested if we could create tools that enable us to value products on a personal level beyond the commercial narrative, pretty much straight away in the moment that we invite them to our lives. Mm, so there are plenty of product stories that uh, out there about the virtues and some idealistic goals and the aspirational narratives promising better world are nothing new. They kind of, that's, that's what keeps us rolling. <laughs> Um, and I've realized uh, by working uh, and looking at sustainable fashion, and which I'm not going to do a deep dive now in because it's complex by itself, that we measure very much when, when it comes to clothing, we measure each other's morality by our product choices, but we like the tools to have fulfilling relationships with whatever, whatever we've chosen. Um, so for me, when I was working on this project, um, it was important to not be judgmental. So I personally don't care if people want to have diamond made from the cactus, piece of toast or sock of the lover, whatever that is. Uh, but because those stories and stories of those products are not, I, I believe that they are not for me to value. Uh, or if this decision making process led uh, them to a conclusion that they would rather keep uh, this cactus because they can't bear the idea of losing it. Uh, but what I care about is creating a reflective tool that will support people at arriving that decision, tools that will celebrate uh, your own complexity and recognize the value of your choice by itself, and there is a value in the choice. So I'm interested in designing decision-making processes that are personal or emotional enough that they can become a story itself, because every decision is a story if we consider it as one. So stories that you share with the product and ones that make those products more inherent and valuable to you. Mm, so I've done a bit of research on emotions. Uh, and uh, one of the things that was quite shocking for me and not that shocking once I uh, thought about it for longer is that uh, in 2016, uh, Professor Gerald Zeltman, and I hope I'm saying the, his name and surname right, uh, showed that 95% of our cognition happens in our emotional brain. So we consider ourselves as a very rational creatures, but in fact, we're like, we're extremely emotional. So emotion is what really drives the purchasing behaviors and also decision-making in general. Uh, and because external stories and values in products are constantly changing, the value starts being in the chase itself. And that is emotionally draining. Uh, but there is a high value in more intimate stories that sometimes, uh, that we sometimes share with products. Uh, and we can develop tools uh, to make this value easier to access. So in this scenario, emotion would be cure as well, uh, I believe. Um, and, and my project kind of proves that because all diamond sources suggested by the people that I've interviewed have emotional reasoning, reasoning behind them, whether it's a, something laughable or something very serious or what, what, in any way I judge it or try to find a reason behind it, it always boils down to the emotional reasoning. Uh, whether it's a joy or love or sentiment. Uh, it appears to be, so this reflective choice of the source and its story uh, made uh, interviews, uh, people who I've who interviewed uh, to feel the, feel the value on the reflective and personal level straight away. And that appears to me to be a first step to sense of emotional satisfaction, satisfaction that we seem to be looking for uh, from products. 
Um, so there is a story. Uh, so this is a diamond made from my mom's cake. Uh, and that is a, my choice was justified by the fact that it's my memory of childhood and her expression of love. So she lives super far away and because of COVID and many different reasons, I have no idea when I'm going to see her again. So this diamond seemed to be a quite good reminder, reminder of her affection, uh, but I personally wish it had more taste. Uh, to the point that sometimes I even wish I had a cake instead. So the value of the, that, that this diamond actually made me appreciate the cake more. Uh, my perception of the diamonds continues to change. I initially I was absolutely like super excited about it. Now I would rather have a cake. My values around it change, but uh, what doesn't change is the emotional story that I've influenced and I have in common with it. Uh, so I can't outdate my own story in this diamond. And this diamond is an interesting part of it. Uh, so that is my primary value, because I can't outdate myself. All the values that this diamond transits. Uh, still made me see a value in it. Uh, so I've de I basically developed a valuable relationship with it. Uh, and that led me to one of the, to that question. So it's, can we, can we could we provide uh, ourselves initially, and then I've expanded it, uh, with opportunities to build fulfilling relationships with products by recognizing uh, personal experiences and stories. So um, we live in the world of relationships and uh, products are an important part of it. And, but if you look at it this way, uh, that basically means a lot of breakups <laughs> constantly. <laughs> uh, and uh, if we go through so many uh, breakups constantly, and that may be a bit of a leap, but if you look at the mental health statistic, no wonder why we feel increasingly unvalidated, unfulfilled, dissociated and uh, desensitized. Uh, our relationships, including those with products are just unfulfilling. Uh, but then if we are looking at fulfillment from products, I really believe uh, uh, through that research that we really need to recognize that the arbitrary storytelling, so the mass storytelling, uh, is a bit of a messy game. Because if you look at the conventional diamond story uh, and the commu and mass communication, you could easily conclude that it suggests that love is a rare, almost unattainable luxury requiring uh, sacrifice and financial validation. Uh, and it's pretty scary to think that we have that we might have like mass engineered culture this way. Uh, and I don't really think we should carry further with similar mass narratives to reinforce similar ideas. Uh, and that's why I think that uh, the, um, we, uh, that I believe that we, it would be good to make choice of the product story a bit more participatory, participatory and uh, reflective process. So. Conversations about stories usually happen quite late in the design uh, process when we need to choose what to communicate. And at many times it ends up being the sales-oriented marketing story, uh, often developed by applying cookie form cat code trends, at least in the uh, reality that I've kind of experienced. But, but there is uh, so much more that I think we could do beyond that. Um, so I think that we are missing, what we're missing is products that have sense of, uh, that we have sense of legacy in and say, as opposed to following, uh, and products, stories that help us rethink and recognize ourselves and our own very, our very own complex story as valuable and worth caring for. And maybe these stories will give us products to care for and will give and will guide us on how to feel more fulfilled and care for ourselves and each other. Uh, I have a few, some, like, I've got some ideas, so that could be done, but not now. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then if we got in a, if we're in relationships with product, if we've got so many, have had so many breakups with them and that's not satisfying. And if we can probably all agree that we know how to design super seductive products, the, the question that came to me last was how to keep this romance with products alive. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's really, that's really that's 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 really the key for me. How to make products uh, interesting um, for a longer period of time. So, um, if we design if we design the romance, we might be able to deal with our, with our consumption patterns, uh, the diminishing mental health that I feel is very much linked to 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 our relationship with products. And in the same time, design new things like tools, narratives, associations, and opportunities and interactions and experiences, and many more that would help us facilitate those relationships. 
uh, and then take them in many different directions if we actually allow ourselves to recognize our relationships with products. Um, so through the Diamond Makers Lab, I've designed a story that keeps me connected with the diamond I've made, but it also enables me to connect with my past and uh, with you now. <laughs> So it might be, uh, I might be ambiguous about the diamonds itself, but I absolutely love telling this story, which brings many more stories my way. So it gives me the feel and the thrill. And I think that's a bit of a romance part that I'm kind of tapping slowly into. That it, the fact that I've got this diamond brings many, many more stories my way. And it's not even only about the diamond, but my connection with it. Um, so this, that is a summary of my discovery, really, or my, my journey, I would say, not even the discovery, because it's continuing, um, that people and their values change, and then we can measure ourselves by our, 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 our virtues, but they're going to change again, as they've changed previously. But we can't update our own story. That's, that's not trends, or that's not related to, uh, it's not changing, it's progressing. I mean, sorry, it's not outdating, it's progressing. And personal sentiment seems to be an anchor that keeps the value of the product despite that change. Uh, and there is a value in the product's ability to be part of your story. So, but that is really not activated enough in my perception. So how we could use that intrinsic value of your personal story to be and reflected in a product. And, and then how to design tools to able to give us stories that will grow our relationships with products as we and our lives change. So how to expand beyond the sentimental bent that is a good start and then keep the romance with products alive. Uh, and that is it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do you want to just, yeah, unshare your screen. So, so back to the, the survey that you did about all the different materials you could make diamonds of. I'm not sure whether you said it and I missed it, but did, was there a conclusion? Was there a material that most people wanted to make it? A diamond out of what was the winner? I've, so I think that, so there was a there was a few layers to this. There were some repetitions, of course, but I tried to I tried to because uh, I I set myself a goal of hundred different sources and justifications. So it was more than hundred inter interviews, and it was more people that I actually asked. Uh, there were some repetitions, but repetitions were usually coming from the fact that people were trying to relate their own story to the story that they know about diamonds, which is related to love. So uh, one of the common things was, for example, um, oh, love letters, or oh, uh, maybe something, my, my, many of them were related to love very much, because that's what people know about diamond, that it represents love. And did you compare that to a control of whether people would prefer, prefer to have a diamond made out of the burnt toast that they had on the first day of their relationship, or the burnt letters that they sent each other or a real diamond from underneath a mountain in Africa somewhere that was formed through millions of years of geological processes and that may be dug up by someone who was being exploited for their labor. I mean, th there's a terrible story to lots of precious stones, isn't there? But they're still extremely sought after. Yeah, so I think um, this Sorry. presentation doesn't Yes, I, I completely, I completely hear what you're saying. And uh, yes, those like narratives that uh, exist in the culture are very much linked to economy, society, and many other things. They, uh, they, for some people, they, they are the, 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 the most attractive ones. And I don't really want to argue with it. But I also, I'm also aware that uh, once they start researching exactly the consequences of diamond mining or the horrible uh, colonial legacy um, and horrible is not enough word to describe it but you know what I'm saying once you get actually educate yourself about the history and the context of the um, traditional mined diamond then you then then the diamond itself as a stone starts starts losing its 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 it's attractiveness really in many cases it's that stops being stops being something that you would like to use to represent loss really um and then it leads to different reflections it's like okay so how do how i'm going to represent love in a different way if if i still want to use a diamond because my let's say fiance or um husband to be 
uh, wants to have a diamond, how I can actually make it more personal. And lab-grown diamonds actually are obviously much less valued than those when, the ones that are formed uh, in, in the mantle of the earth. So how, how something that is lab-grown could carry similar, similar, similar emotion, emotionally loaded story. Does that make sense what I'm saying? It's a bit of a, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And because it, it's interesting, isn't it, that um, we know that so many of the things that are prized I and mean, have been prized historically um, are, are bad. There are bad processes involved like diamond mining, you know, rhino horns, the, the kind of obsession with eating certain mm -hmm. rare species. And even though we now know the bad stories behind those materials and those, uh, those products, they still have a value. And in some ways, maybe the value is even higher because there's a kind of maybe a sort of perverse thrill for people to getting hold of things that are running out or that have a kind of horror story behind them. So do you have a, an explanation for that? And if we're talking about how materials and objects have, have stories that make people feel more comfortable or build you know, positive relationships with the object, if the object has a horror story behind it, a state of death and exploitation, why do people still <laughs> desire those things? Mm. I I think I think that it's because we um, again what we are following we're following very much the external story so we're following the commercial narrative when you wear a diamond men like first question is not how many people did it kill or how many environments it it how 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 what was the cost of the on the environment of actually producing it it's first thing that you see is are oh, you married it's amazing congratulations so that's the uh, that's the that's the mass um the mass narrative that we are kind of aspiring through it uh instead of reflecting upon actually what what is the story that we want to nurture within ourselves i think that's the that's the balance that we didn't, didn't not even sure if it's a balance but yeah, I'd... these are all symbols, aren't they? And at some point, the symbol starts being more important than uh, anything else, any story or any production process. And uh, to deconstruct that symbol and to create another symbol uh, that can could replace it in the future, so we uh, with the, with similar strength. I think that's that's that is really difficult. Um, but I think it happens through the personal reflection. I, I, well, there was one diamond that was really interesting for me when I was looking at it. Someone, someone, I was interviewing someone and that person said, oh God, I would love to have a diamond from this like super rare plant. And I was just like, okay, this is really interesting because if you're going to make a diamond from that plant, that plant's going to die. <laughs> so maybe like, let's leave it there. And, 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 and I had a conversation with that person and I was like, okay, why would you do it? And, and, and what, 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 without obviously my face was probably saying enough, but uh, but they were they were like oh because it's because it's rare and I want to remember I want to have it here because that's going to make a diamond super rare. That's like the, this idea of rarity, and and I was like okay, but that's like how 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 do you like how that was pretty much what I was saying. Like that's that's the literal repetition, and the and the response was yeah. I mean when you think about it. I'm not going to be able to, I'm not, we had a quite long conversation about it. And the, the end point was, the end point was that they, uh, they might actually, they might actually get a plant itself, which was really interesting. Because uh, it was like a step, it was a tiny step from actually killing the plant to turning into the valuable stone and nurturing a plant by itself. They still wanted to have the plant because it was super rare instead of keeping in this natural habitat. But it was already a progression. There was this way of thinking that, okay, so the plant is value, has a value by itself, not a diamond, so I want a plant now. But that's already like a bit of a move. In English, we call that having your plants and eating it or having your cake and eating it. I want to ask a variation of the same question to the other panelists. It'd be good to hear from you, Sital. This, this idea, this kind of paradox in a way of, of so many things that we consume, so many things that we buy and cherish have really terrible stories behind them. How do you, how do you, how do you explain that? Why, do, why are people addicted to having things that are 
historically bad and have a bad trail behind them? That's so complex to kind of unpack in a few minutes. Um, I think a lot of the way that a lot of these objects are positioned or framed is about desire ultimately. So how they're kind of positioned is so desirable that they almost don't, humans perhaps don't even care what's happened to it before because there's like an, I think Aniello describing the emotional sort of component to an object means that you don't necessarily, you almost forget its history because of how it's presented to you in this very sort of evocative, um, sexy even, um, I think that sort of appeal to a lot, that appeals to a lot of society, I think. And perhaps that eliminates the almost guilt or shame attached to um, its history. Because a lot of what we are working with material wise has a deep colonial history and yet that hasn't been raised a lot of the time. And cotton, for example, is one of the most used fibers across the planet. And yet its colonial history is something that hasn't necessarily been addressed or in the way that it should be, or like, or how, what is our relationship to cotton now and its colonial history and how it's shaped the way that society is, is framed upon. But there are a lot of people shifting that narrative and presenting that narrative in an entirely different way. So it's becoming something that is being highlighted, but it's also trying to make that narrative relatable. Because a lot of what is presented to us are numbers. And numbers in a way that feels really far away far removed from how we can relate to it like on a daily basis and that becomes a bit far removed from us um, and because that's removed from us we kind of ignore it so that ignorance somehow needs to be reframed in a narrative that feels more relational more accessible ultimately because everything to me is about relationality and access um, and if that is something that we can shift, um, especially with the narrative first, um, I think therefore we can start to, as a society, engage with the world around us more deeply and more curiously, actually. So I think it's emotional, but it's about access, how we access this information, how we present this information, and also it's our duty as designers to do that, I think. And I think the panel here is very much engaged in that kind of practice. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my take on it, I guess. Lisa, I'd like to bring you in here now and the, the, the same question in a way, but also the, this notion that people form relationships with objects that in a way puts the designer in a position perhaps of having to choose the narrative they want to highlight, which often is being done to, to, to turn a, a story of destruction and um, colonialism and exploitation into a story of cutesy desirabilities. A designer somehow responsible for putting, putting the wrong narrative in play, do you think? <laughs> um, um... <laughs> or a false narrative? What do you mean? So that designers uh, choose false narratives to give a stage in order to make, to create awareness? Well, if we're talking about how people form relationships with objects, and obviously we're talking about the, the positive reasons for that, because, uh, you know, it has a, some kind of personal memory or some kind of cultural evocation that means something to them, or it, it tells, it ex expresses something about that person's opinion of this themselves and their values and so on and so forth. We tend to think about that as a largely positive thing, but there are all kinds of problems with lots of objects. Like we're talking about the problem with sheep, the problem with diamonds, the problem with 
cotton. We're aware that those those materials and those um, processes are can be destructive, and yet we still buy give diamonds as gifts. We still um, you know, consume fast fashion clothes without really caring about how they get thrown away. So why? What is the what is the important? What is the why are we so interested in the narratives that we form with products in the first place when so many of those narratives could be horrible to us, repulsive? Yeah, I think um, um, we we all um, uh, yeah, sort of uh, relate to the objects around us. And of course, designers play an important role with highlighting the different and also what Christine said, uh, really layered stories that uh, products entail. Um, it's 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 uh, in, in our current society where we, at least in our Western world, of course, are dealing with mass consumption. Uh, it's getting more and more clear that the products that we actually use um, uh, are maybe not from sources that we uh, that we are proud of. And I think that with, um, with these types of stories that are uh, now getting um, more and more into the openness, it's a start at least for people to start making different choices. And even though, um, uh, you know, what you mentioned indeed in, in terms of fashion, this is of course already uh, wildly um, uh, um, in a broad sense uh, changing, more and more people now know where clothes actually come from. But I think in terms of products, this is still a relatively um, a new subject uh, that people need to uh, relate to still, where our products actually come from and what actually makes a product. Um, and I think during this first wave of the pandemic that we experienced, we started realizing um, also that, of course, this COVID um, is, is happening to us uh, also because the, 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 um, the world that we created is now sort of turning a bit of, against us. And I hope sort of that, that the second wave is that we now take the time to start thinking about what we can change and how we sort of should change the, re the way we relate to our products and um, uh, start engaging with them in a more meaningful way. And do you think it's important that people do form relationships with with objects because you could argue also that it's better that they don't because then you know you buy a, a breakfast a, a bowl for your breakfast cereal and you use it and then it breaks and then you throw it away and you buy another one and, and you can it's better to not experience pain <laughs> and, and loss with something as obvious as a bowl or something maybe with a guitar it's a bit different because it's something you have a more long-term and intimate relationship with but why why is there this obsession with forming relationships with things surely we should be forming relationships with people well i think that's crucial in order to have a sort of a connected way of of living um and if we uh um getting into a sort of an emotional relation both with people and with objects requires a certain form of uh, vulnerability as well it's a bit scary uh, indeed what you say it might break you might lose it um but i think that's sort of the only way also to reach um, uh, sort of a fulfillment in life and to uh, understand what you surround yourself with and why that is important. And Christina, I wanted to ask you as well about a similar version of the question, but also when we're talking about an object, like you can own an object, like you can own a carpet, so you can form a relation, a type of relationship with the carpet because it's yours, it's in your house, no one else can take that carpet away. But in terms of the narrative of the products, you don't own the sheep, you don't own the landscape where the sheep was eating the grass and so on and so forth. But you can still have relationships with places, can't you, with landscapes and so on and so forth. Why is the relationship with the products being talked about as the most important relationship? Well, I think you just mentioned like, why, don't, why do we form relationships with objects and not with people? But I think that in that question is not actually correct because by using that bowl, you form a connection to that person that made the bowl or who was transporting it to you or who uh, sold it to you in the shop. So this whole chain of production, it's not just material, it's people who are a part of it. So I think it's, it's two things that you can't really see 
apart from each other. If you understand what I mean. But does that happen in your life? So when you have a, a cereal bowl or a spoon or something like that, when you're using that spoon, are you conscious of that whole chain, human chain, material chain, um, environmental chain that got that spoon to you? Or are you just thinking? Yeah, yeah. I kind of like, <laughs> when I look at an object, like my mouse or like, uh, I don't know, yarn or, or uh, Sita's book here, anything has a sort of layered cloud of information hanging around it, which is the people, it's the transport, it's the kilometers it's made, it's where is it gonna go? It's just, it's just an endless amount of information clouded around objects around me. So yeah, so yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> to feel a little bit sorry for the cereal bowl it has this weight of expectation <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it makes also everything around us uh super interesting so i, I really liked Aniela's story about you know falling in love with objects is like um yeah there are so many sides to it but it also makes anything you lift a very interesting detective that you can explore or that you can improve or uh, maybe decide it shouldn't have been there in the first place but yeah it's just endlessly interesting as well or have adventures with really because that's another thing is that you can and you can multiply meanings and you can lay at them if i'm going to plant my diamond in a pot and decide i want to grow a flower from it that's going to be a diamond that never grew a flower right and that's it that's a new diamond <laughs> yeah <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll finish up with a, a lighter question for all of you. Um, and, and the question is this, like in the, the current situation we all find ourselves, is, is forming relationships with objects, is having objects, is it more important or less important and why? And by the current situation, I mean, of course, we're in the coronavirus pandemic. We're in a time where climate change has, has started to happen. We're in a time when we're aware of the... The, the impact that we're having on ecosystems and on the planet. Um, so you can answer the question however you want, but I also want to explain why that relationship is less or more important. Lisa, do you want to go first? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, it probably won't come as a surprise that I think um, in, in these times it's actually even more important. I mean, we're all stuck at our homes um, relating to the objects that we have um, more than ever. Um, also um, uh, tidying and throwing away things and buying new things because we now have the time. Um, and I actually hope that this pandemic sort of makes us think um, what I said more about what we then uh, bring, the, the few things that we bring in um, and how the story that we, we connect to them so that we actually um, keep it for a long time, uh, which in the end also hopefully um, breaks down this entire system of materialism and by consumerism a bit by bit. Okay, thanks a lot. Sital? Uh, of course I'm going to say yes. <laughs> um, I think it's really integral to have a relationship to the non-human world so that humans can sort of coexist rather than dominate, which is how we've been existing for a really long time. And this dominant sort of behavior has always has existed within our political systems and also um, the way that we have produced capitalism has been a really big component into why we are in such a position of mass consumption as well. So I think we are presented with something that is seen as universal. And this universalism is something seen as um, the only way to do something, the only way to produce, the only way to converse, the only way to um, design even. So there's, all, there's only been one way of doing. And actually so many cultures are present in our world and our society, yet we operate in such a linear way. So for me, the relationship between human and materials and objects 
is such an integral component of how we can see the world differently to enforce change, to Im impact something that is actually more embracing of um, pluralities and multiples so that we can see that there's, we don't need to just operate in a mass consumption world. We can think about other systems. We can think about like designing for disassembly or designing for um, longevity we're only designing for longevity and then disposability. That's what we're designing for at the moment and in a mass production world. And I think that's really problematic and we can design in other forms in other speeds at other scales as well. And that's something that I think a lot of independent designers are presenting right now. So I think for me, that's quite encouraging. Christine? Yeah, I think um, I agree with Sital, and I also think that it's um, it's important to try to learn how how you value objects, how that is colored by your culture and where you come from. So, for instance, I come from the Netherlands, and we kind of learn from where, from when we are a young age that like. Um, uh, trade is a good thing and uh, and it and it taught us that the value of an object is is what it is so a t-shirt that costs 10 euros that's it but we have to really sort of try to unlearn that narrative that an object is just based on its financial value because it basically has nothing to do with what its actual value and meaning is so um yeah, I really agree that this layeredness and the, the actual meaning of objects, I think we're just at the beginning of starting to understand what the meaning of products actually is and how much we are actually um, intertwined with products ourselves, how they are a part of our bodies. Uh, uh, you know, We don't even know how much we are connected to the objects around us. So. Yeah, I think in that sense for designers, it's a super interesting time. Um, and, you know, um, you can look at it as a very negative, <laughs> very complicated time, but it's at the same time, super challenging and super interesting times to work with as well, or work in as well. Great, so three, three so far in favor of more relationships with objects rather than less. And finally, Aniela? Yeah, I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I really believe that's important because, uh, well, if we recognize relationships with objects and materials and actually everything that surrounds us, because now, because now we're talking about objects, but by objects, I could say everything if we go into the deeper philosophical level. Um, I think it's really important to recognize our relationships because if, if this is relationships, if you want to have a healthy relationships with someone, something, you want to know them and you, you ask them questions and you treat them as a partner and then you also recognize complexity and I think we're really uncomfortable with complexity in general and we are so used to like very simplistic narratives that are pretty like one like give me one sentence <laughs> uh, kind of storytelling that um, that don't allow those relationships really to happen because it's more of a projection rather than relationship um, so I think it could yeah I just I just think it it could take us to new places and it could challenge us in new ways. And I think we really need that. Okay, so that's four in favor. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Aniela, Lisa, Christine and Sital. Great to speak to you all. And Zine will be back tomorrow at three o'clock UK time for another episode of our exploration of Dutch Design Week. And meanwhile, you can go onto the website and look at our Dutch Design Week posts and see a tour that we've curated that includes um, all of the speakers from the whole series of talks. Thanks very much. And thanks especially to Lisa for putting this together for us. Bye-bye. Thank you.